Welcome back to the Enfield Talking newspaper. Now we return to local news with Janet. People face losing their homes after Enfield Council demanded they pay at least £15,000 towards much needed improvements. More than 30 families, couples and pensioners who recently bought a lease on flats in Town Road, Edmonton have been told to pay huge sums for the building work. The council is spending millions on modernising its council homes, but estimates each Brent Court leaseholder needs to contribute between fifteen and twenty-five thousand pounds. Simon Rowley, who bought a lease on a flat in order to get his daughter Louisa on the housing ladder, said the council letter demanded sixteen thousand three hundred and eleven pounds. It arrived on our doorstep in mid-December, ruining our Christmas. Everyone is shocked, angry and upset, or a combination of all three. It's unbelievable. I, I couldn't believe it when I heard about it. The distress and hardship the council is putting people with little disposable income through is just immoral. This comes after years of neglect. Mr Rowley said one leaseholder was a 78-year-old woman who faced a £25,000 charge. He said the prospect of a debt that she would simply never be able to repay meant she could, lose, she could lose her home of 30 years. During a meeting with leaseholders, Mr Rowley said council staff told him the improvements follows five years of planning and would start soon. His daughter, 26-year-old photographer Louisa, said, We cannot pull this sort of money out of nowhere. The flat was not a bargain price either. And we paid for a flat in good condition. Councillor Ahmed Okna, Cabinet Member for Housing, said, Enfield Council has a statutory duty as a landlord to maintain its housing stock and is carrying out a much-needed investment programme to ensure that our properties are kept to a decent standard and are safe and secure. Leaseholders are responsible on the terms of their lease to contribute their share of work carried out on the block and the shared areas. This is a clear stipulation of the lease and is always drawn to attention before signing. We appreciate the impact this can have and actively approach leaseholders as early as possible once we know that works are likely to be completed. We we'll always work with individual leaseholders to assess the best repayment options available to them for their circumstances and would encourage our leaseholders to contact us to go through these. Award-winning comedian Shazia Mirza is touring the UK with her solo show, The Kardashians Made Me Do It. Shazia's comedy is quite often autobiographical. She talks about her life, relationships and parents, but is also somewhat political and opinionated. Her current show is markedly more politically charged. She explains why this is. I was in New York with a friend and we saw a t on TV that three girls from Bethnal Green had joined ISIS. We were really shocked. Shazia contributed a piece for radio, BBC Radio about the news item and it received record numbers of complaints which led her to write the show. I had an instant reaction to it and I thought I can say something about this and relate it to my upbringing. I just wanted to say that it's got nothing to do with religion or politics. These young girls just fancy these men. They are the one direction of religion. Shazia grew up in Birmingham but now lives in Muswell Hill. Her stand-up routines have taken her all over the world to places like America, Pakistan, India and the Middle East. Wherever you go, you have to be funny. Everyone likes stuff they feel they, like they can relate to. Wherever I go, I tailor stuff to that audience. Jihadi brides, perhaps people won't relate to, but I can get comedy out of everything. She has appeared on various TV and radio shows, including BBC's Have I Got News For You and The One Show and Radio 4's The Now Show. She also wrote a weekly common for The Guardian entitled Diary of a Disappointing Daughter. 
Shazia once was a science teacher at a school in Tower Hamlets, and she believes this experience prepared her for a career in stand-up comedy. They hated me, and I hated them. I used to tell them jokes to pass the time. When I look back, that is where I learned stand-up. That was really good training for me because I never had that much abuse as a comedian. One of her students was grime musician Dizzy Rascal, who Chazia bumped into years later. She says, he shouted up the red carpet, Miss, Miss! He went on to comment on how well she was doing while she, Shazia tells me, was thinking, what a nightmare you were. Shazia never dreamt of being a comedian, but was interested in acting and writing. While still working as a teacher, she started a writing course, and it was here that she discovered her comedic talent. You had to write things that were personal, that you were angry or sad about. The first thing I wrote about was having a moustache and all the things I tried to get rid of it, and everyone laughed and thought it was hilarious. Female body hair later became a to- topic for Shazia's BBC documentary. Many people would consider this to be a feminist subject, but that's not what made Shazia want to do it. Feminism wasn't in fashion then. Everyone is a feminist now. I've never felt the need to say it. I did that programme because people were prejudiced against women who are hairy, and I thought it was a fun thing to do. Enfield town boss Bradley Quinton hopes to sign a striker. The towner's boss is close to bringing in the forward to boost their goal threat and help their promotion push in the Ryman Premier Division. Quinton said, We hope to get him within the next couple of days and are just waiting on international clearance. We want to keep it under wraps because we missed out on another player recently. He's playing full-time football and has been abroad and certainly knows how to score goals. The manager continued... We are always looking to strengthen. If people keep missing chance after chance and someone comes along with the right attitude, then I will always look for a player like that. He's a good player. While he hopes to tie up this deal shortly, Quinton has allowed Dernal Winter to join Ware Town on a month's loan. The towner's boss said, We've allowed him to go out on loan and I'm sure he will do well. He just needs some sharpness and game time. He's a young striker that wants to get goals and the loan will do him good. Enfield's last league game was a very disappointing 3-2 defeat at VCD Athletic, but the manager has backed them to put this right. (coughs) Quinton said, They are a great bunch of lads and it's about making sure they have that mental focus. It is crucial they switch on for the rest of the season. I have a lot of players knocking on the door to play and that will only help competition as we try to reach the playoffs. The manager added, each game is crucial for the rest of the season. They, Burgess Hill, are mid-table and we will see how they line up. But we're focused on ourselves and what we need to do. Enfield Town's scheduled league game at home to Kingstonian, was postponed due to a waterlogged pitch. The team have been drawn at home to Ashford Town in the semi-finals of the Middlesex Senior Cup in the week commencing February 22nd. Enfield earned their spot in the last four of the competition after winning 3-2 at Hampton and Richmond last week. The visitors opened the scoring after six minutes. Bobby Devine produced a composed finish from the edge of the area, but the goal was cancelled out within a minute when Charlie Moon wrong-footed Nathan MacDonald. Hampton took the lead into the break after Eddie Hutchinson glanced his header into the net. It should have been 3-1 from the penalty, but Moon blasted his effort onto the crossbar. This was a crucial miss as almost immediately afterwards... Enfield broke away and levelled through substitute Corey Whiteley. The visitors sealed the comeback win with Whiteley's second of the game. 
It's 15 years since the Mill Hill-born actor Harry Melling first appeared on our screens as Dudley Dursley in the Harry Potter movies, a role he played from ages 10 to 19. And not only has he transformed physically, but he has made the stage his focus. Harry went on to train at the prestigious London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art, Lambda, has appeared at the National Theatre Barbican, Trafalgar Studios and Southwark Playhouse and is now preparing to take to the West End stage in Hand to God. The show, which was a smash hit on Broadway, is an irreverent human and puppet comedy set in a devoutly religious Texan town. In terms of acting, this is like nothing I've done before, explains the 26-year-old, who plays shy teenager Jason, who finds his puppet Tyrone seemingly possessed by the devil and leading his friends into sin. It's a very different acting challenge that, to be honest, scared me senseless to begin with, as I had no idea how to do it. It's been the biggest challenge of my acting career so far. Although Harry started out with a role in the second highest grossing film series in the world, he seemed destined for a life of drama long before then. I come from a quite hideous dynasty of actors. There's loads of us, says Harry, who is the grandson of former Doctor Who Patrick Troughton and nephew of respected actors David and Michael Troughton. Hideous men in the nicest way, he laughs. I fell in love with theatre watching my Uncle David in The Tempest at the RSC when I was very young. So young, I had to be in the director's box. The former pupil of St Paul's C of E Primary School on the Ridgeway landed the role in Harry Potter after his mother, Joanna Troughton, sent his photograph to casting directors and says working on the films definitely taught him a lot. Working with Richard, the late Richard Griffiths, and Fiona, Shaw, was amazing. The way they worked, their wit, intellect and sense of fun are all things that hopefully, through osmosis, have got into me somewhere. But Harry emphasises that Harry Potter was a long time ago and it's clear he's keen to shake off the mantle of fame the films bring. The films did more than just make him a name. He used his earnings to transfer from Hendon School to attend the fee-paying Mill Hill School, a move that helped further his drama training. In terms of state and private education, I couldn't care less, but there were things I wanted to do in terms of drama that weren't facilitated. So I sent myself off to Mill Hill School up the road when I was 15 and paid the fees. My parents couldn't afford it, but luckily Harry Potter could. He also became a member of the National Youth Theatre, but says it was getting into Lambda that changed everything. I guess you have to start again after Harry Potter, because it's such a huge franchise, so where do you go after that? What sort of actor do you want to become? One that goes from franchise to franchise trying to make as much money as possible? That's not what I wanted. I wanted to act, and I've always loved the theatre. He left Lambda early to appear in Mother Courage and Her Children at the National Theatre, once again playing Fiona Shaw's son, and last year wrote and performed Peddling at the Arcola. Harry was in Prague filming an episode for the third series of BBC drama The Musketeers when the call came for the Hand to God audition. Rehearsals began in early January, and mastering the intricacies of puppetry have been a real challenge for Harry who now lives in Leytonstone and loves the colour of East London. Every second I'm not in rehearsals, I've been hanging out with Tyrone. If you remember, that's the name of his puppet. He has sort of lived with me for the last month. It's amazing how you begin to think like him, and you can isolate parts of yourself and your thoughts. You're fundamentally talking to your hand, and you have to make that thing breathe life. That's been the challenge of the play. Harry says he can identify with both the shy teenager he plays who is dealing with his father's death and trying to figure out who he is and the wicked Tyrone who stirs up trouble. We've all been in those situations where we can't quite choose our words correctly to illustrate what's going on and equally have been that person who has gone with the flow and done whatever he wanted to do in that moment. The great parts explore those extremes. Whether Tyrone is psychologically the devil on his shoulder or literally that supernatural thing, that's for the audience to decide. That is beautifully ambiguous. Hand to God plays at the Vaudeville Theatre, The Strand, WC2R, ONH, from February the 5th to June the 11th. You can find details on the website, handtogod.co.uk. 
A move by opposition councillors to overturn the cycle Enfield project was defeated at a full council meeting. At the meeting held at the Enfield Civic Centre in Silver Street, Tory group leader Terry Neville launched into an attack on plans to plough ahead with the £42 million cycle Enfield scheme that will see partially segregated cycle lanes in Palmer's Green, Enfield Town and Southbury Road. He told the Chamber and packed public gallery, we say that enhanced provision should be made away from the heavily trafficked roads like those chosen by Labour for these schemes. That would provide safer, quieter and healthier cycling and it can be done and for a fraction of the £42 million we are talking about here. However, Daniel Anderson, Cabinet Member for Environment, who is in charge of delivering the scheme, accused the opposition benches of flip-flopping on the issue in an opportunistic bid to be seen to be taking the side of businesses opposed to changes in parking provision. He drew the Council's attention to the fact that the Tory benches had given their support to the bid for the cycling money when the proposal was first mooted in 2012. The bid, signed by both Councillor Taylor, Council Leader, and Councillor Lavender, then Tory Group Leader, initiated by Councillor Bond, then Cabinet Member for the Environment, was completely clear right from the outset about the radical change we were proposing to the borough's infrastructure and a vision of a better Enfield, he said. But now Councillor Neville has the audacity to do a complete about-face. After extending the time for opposition business twice so that almost every councillor had their say in a two-hour debate, the motion to throw out the current scheme was defeated by 34 votes to 19. Speaking while the councillors were trading blows, Robert Taylor, the Secretary of the Federation of Enfield Residents and Allied Associations, told the advertiser that he had heard many defences from the council that angered him, as he is representing the residents who are opposed to the scheme. I thought Councillor Neville's opening speech was extremely good, said Mr Taylor. He covered the points extremely well. The latest consultation on the Cycle Enfield scheme in Four Street from Edmonton Green Roundabout is underway and will close on February the 12th. To have your say on the consultation, log on to www.cycleenfield.co.uk. <coughs> The plans for this stretch of the cycleway include proposals for the Edmonton Green Roundabout modelled on the Dutch practice of separating bikes from pedestrians and cars to prevent accidents. Parks would be cleaned less frequently and residents could also face higher parking costs as Enfield Council plans to save £24.4 million by 2019-20. stroke Services for vulnerable people and children face the biggest reduction in funding, with plans to axe £13.4 million from the budget in health, housing and adult social services. These include support services for disabled people, those with mental health problems and the elderly. The borough's homeless prevention schemes and domestic violence services are also under threat. School and children's services would also be hit by the drastic savings target, with the council intending to claw back a total of £8.7 million in the next four financial years. The council's budget proposals for 2016-17 are due to be discussed and considered for approval at a meeting on Wednesday the 24th of February. Children's Centres, the School Improvement Service, Children's Mental Health Services, Youth Services and the Early Years Services would all be affected. For disabled children, the Labour-run Council plans to make reductions in transport, 
overnight short breaks, out of school activities, including play and short break grants, as well as direct payments and home care for parents of disabled children. The Council is also seeking to change service providers for many services, such as shop mobility, to make the savings. Community policing is also targeted with proposals to slash the budget for police community support officers by more than half. The remaining £180,000 allocated to the PCSO team would be used to address key policing concerns in parks and increase CCTV coverage and a likely restructuring of the team. Across the borough, cuts to cleaning services have also been proposed and free leisure activities at leisure centres would take a hit, with the council looking to halve the festival's budget. Residents could also face higher parking costs as the council proposes bringing in more controlled parking zones because the current ones do not make enough money. In total, the council plans to make £7.5 million in savings during 2016-17, £7.4 million in 2017-18, million in 2018 19 and £3.6 million in 2019 stroke 20. Children from an Edmonton school performed a moving dance in tribute to the 10,000 children who escaped the Nazi regime on the kinder transport. The youngsters from Hazelbury Junior School in Hazelbury Road took to the stage at the Dugdale Centre in London Road, Enfield Town, as part of this year's Holocaust Memorial Day events. Their dance, entitled Into the Arms of Others, commemorated the thousands of children from Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Poland and the free city of Danzig who came to Britain on the kinder transport before the start of World War II. It was the last time many of them ever saw their families who became victims of the Nazi genocide which claimed the lives of millions. The theme of this year's event was Don't Stand By and students from Southgate School in Sussex Way, Cock Fosters, recounted the life stories of people who decided to take a stand. Tom Knowles shared the story of Sir Nicholas Winton, the stockbroker who arranged trains to get children out of Czechoslovakia. Another pupil, Elise Hellyer, talked about Raphael Lemkin, a Polish Jewish lawyer who coined the term genocide and was involved in the Nuremberg trials which prosecuted Nazis for war crimes. The event marked 71 years since Russian troops liberated the Auschwitz death camp in Poland in 1945. The gathering also heard from Rabbi Yuval Keren from the Southgate Progressive Synagogue in Chase Road and Rabbi Emmanuel Levy from the Palmer's Green and Southgate Synagogue in Brownlow Road. A book with the word Jew printed six million times reminded the congregation of the number of Jewish victims of the Nazis. The congregation was also shown a film about the genocide in Darfur in Sudan, which began in 2003. A high-tech initiative to counter local authority fraud is set to help Enfield Council catch benefit cheats and those who try to swindle it. All 33 of the capital's boroughs have joined the London Counter Fraud Hub which has been created with £430,000 of government cash. Helped by state-of-the-art technology, the hub uses council and government data as well as commercially available sources such as credit reports and works with the police, the National Crime Agency and the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy to detect fraud and recover cash. It will be operational at the end of the year. Andrew Stafford, Enfield's Cabinet Member for Finance and Efficiency, said, As councils struggle to cope with massively reduced budgets, it is more important than ever to fight fraud. 
This new hub will build on existing counter-fraud work to help ensure that public funding is spent on public services. Edward Lord, chairman of the Capital Ambition Board, added, The London counter-fraud hub has the potential to save local authorities significant sums of money and could prove a very good investment in the fight against fraud. Traders are celebrating after their revamp market scooped a prestigious award. Enfield Town Market, which scaled up its operations last year with bright new awnings, artisan food stalls and a dedicated covered food hall, was awarded the best large community market accolade by the National Association of British Market Authorities at a ceremony in Birmingham. The market underwent the revamp after the old Enfield Charitable Trust lost money on the venture for the first time in its history in 2013. Accepting the award, the chairman of the old Enfield Charitable Trust Market Committee, Jim Eustace, congratulated the traders on their success. Speaking after the award ceremony, he said, well done for the hard work and cooperation prior to the launch of the regenerated Enfield market and the subsequent effort that has been maintained thus far by everyone involved. It has been satisfying to witness the marketplace full of such a variety of stalls, attracting a capacity throng of shoppers and inquisitive pedestrians. It has been an added bonus to be awarded an accolade from NABMA in recognition of our efforts. He added that he hoped the new high-profile market would allow the Trust to highlight the charity work it does with the profits raised from pitch fees. There is still much to be done before we reach our finest hour, he said. We've reached the end of our programme for this week. Thank you for listening. Sorry if there were a few hiccups this week. We're still getting used to the new equipment. From the team of Janet, Sally, Colin and Keith and Robin on the controls, it's goodbye. goodbye. Please remember to turn over the address label in your postal packet, put the cassette into the packet and return it to us as soon as possible in readiness for the next edition. Don't forget you can call Diane de Jersey regarding any help you may require in connection with Enfield Talking Newspaper. The Enfield Talking Newspaper will be with you again in one week's time. <laughs>